Good morning. Um, since I got here, I've learned one important thing from the dean, um, Dr. Assis. He, he made me understand, and it wasn't even in plenary, he made me understand that security is the service we are delivering, but the destination is peace. Everything that we are doing to ensure security is so that we arrive at peace. The commodity we provide, at least most of those of us in this room, is to provide security. And then we work the security until we get peace. I think it's like um, stirring milk until you get some butter. But we will get there. I am here to explain that despite the challenges of young people, despite the non-inclusion in some parts of Africa of young people, things are happening. This is the case of Ghana, and I suspect it is the same for many of you who are seated here. You might find similarities, you might find differences. Some of the similarities may be in your favor, and some of the differences may also be in your favor, that Ghana is doing worse than you, and you might want to pat yourself on the back. But in whichever case, we are here to learn from each other and move on from there. So Ghana, like most of you, most of the African countries, as she has described, has the same problems, the same challenges, and the same positives. But I want to start with a question, particularly with my colleagues in uniform. How many of you are of the opinion that back home, you have some very troublesome young people on your hands? On paper, you read that you, you have to do this with the youth, but in practice, you know you have some troublesome young people on your hands. Let me see by hand if you feel like that. And at least, it's not being... The audience is not being recorded, so you can, be, you can be clear and raise your hand. If you genuinely think that some young people are some, there are some troublesome young people on your hands. I have, oh, then I am done here. We, we do not have anybody whose youth in their country are causing trouble. Okay, let me ask a second question. If, assuming you knew the answer and you decided not to answer, for the sake of saving face for your country, if you have troublesome people in your country, how many of you think that the overall security situation in your country will be so improved once these people are dealt with? Almost all your problems will be non-existent once these people are dealt with. You don't think so? Some people do think so. And for those who think so, the question is how? Because... If there are troublesome people in your country, you must deal with them. The question is, how? Do you send attack dogs after them? Do you engage them? It is the how we are going to discuss. I'll start by discussing the major issues that we face in Ghana. And I suspect that is the same for the rest of Africa. One theme has cut across since we came here last week. And that has been the youth board. I am here to discuss the youth board in another context. The youth bulge not as the problem, but as the beginning of a problem, so long as we do not manage it well. I'm looking at the youth bulge leading to unemployment. Particularly in Ghana, unemployment rates keep coming down. But in terms of actual numbers, so when you look at the percentages, the percentage keeps coming down. That means, depending on which side of st the statistics you are, if you're on the side of the government, you can see we've created more jobs. Unemployment rate has gone down. But in terms of real numbers, the population is growing. So in terms of real numbers, we are having more and more unemployed people on our hands. But let us look at the, the, the percentages again. We have 1.76 million persons unemployed, according to the World Bank. Now, that represents 3.9% of, of Ghana's working population. That's the unemployment rate in Ghana. That means by the statistics alone, by the statistics alone, we are doing better than Denmark. Denmark has 4.2% unemployment rate. Does that not suggest that if unemployment is in itself the security issue, does that not suggest that Ghana should be more secure than Denmark? This is to say that the challenges we face are not in isolation. You cannot just take one challenge and say that once we deal with this situation, everything will be fine. You might deal with the unemployment, but there might be a governance de deficit. So the challenges I'm going to enumerate are to be taken collectively. 
and not that when you take one challenge and you deal with that challenge, you are fine. The next challenge is underemployment. I have dealt with unemployment and I've dealt, I'm dealing with underemployment. The issue with underemployment is that a lot of young people are unwillingly working in jobs that are lower than the skill sets they, provide, they have. And some of them are just doing part-time because that's the only opportunity available. Now, typically, when you're looking at unemployment rates, you don't consider these people as unemployed. These are underemployed people. You are having engineers who have studied mechanical engineering, um, aerospace engineering, and what are they doing? They are ticketing officers. I'm not, I don't have any problem with ticketing officers, but these are people who will be super frustrated in these jobs. Now, this underemployment, again, like the youth bulge, is not a problem in itself. Look at the underemployment leading to desperation that leads to migration. People are just leaving at the first opportunity without even considering the opportunity, without even checking the veracity of the opportunity. Whether this is true or false, they just go. And they will do anything. Now, we have people doing regular, those who can are finding regular means of migration. Those who cannot find regular means of migration but are desperate enough are finding irregular means of migration. So, you can talk about the migration routes through Libya despite the fact that that, that part of Africa is still unstable. People are going on foot by road to go to, to get to the Mediterranean so that they can get to Europe these desperate journeys. And when you interview some of these people who are undertaking these journeys, these are the, the cream of the crop. These are the most highly educated people who are doing everything to get out of Africa, to get out of their countries. And even those who have gone through negative experiences with regular, with irregular migration, I have it here that they are more likely to repeat it when the opportunity presents itself again. Let me give you a quote from Ghana's Minister of Information, Kojo Ponkuma. He says, it's not a quote, I'm just paraphrasing him, that data from a survey conducted on irregular migrants showed that 98% of the almost 2,000 irregular migrants show willingness to embark on the same dangerous journey even after witnessing firsthand the dangers associated with it. This is the climate we have. So the statistics might paint a very good picture, but we are not counting those who are leaving. Now, there is a governance deficit too. I'm just focusing on three challenges. And if you leave us, we will go on and on and on about these challenges. But there is a governance deficit. I'm going to, and for the academics here who are so strict on terminology, please forgive me in advance. I'm going to use governance deficits to explain a host of issues. Now, government is expected to provide certain services, human rights, fundamental freedoms, justice, inclusion, transparency, accountability. When I talk about governance deficits, I also want to include corruption because it is not part of good governance to be corrupt. Now, what do we have? We have mismanagement, injustice, state capture by a group of political elites, weak and ineffective institutions. These may be perceived or ongoing. Now, someone might think he's a Ghanaian and he's standing here giving all these negative adjectives about Ghana. Do you know my source? Our current national security strategy. This is the exact wording in Ghana's current national security strategy that we are working with. So I'm not here shaming Ghana. I'm just presenting what the state sees as a problem. Now, back to young people. What is the role of youth-led advocacy engagement? Now, young people are such that if you do not solve their problems for them, they will solve it themselves. The problem on, a, on the hands of a lot of states is that because you are not involved in young people solving their own problems, you are not able to control how they do it. And that is when 
uh, officers here will start seeing other negative manifestations that they are not so comfortable with. Let's take entrepreneurship. This is one way young people, at least in Ghana, and I can say the same for our cousins, the Nigerians, and a lot of the other countries. If the problem of unemployment of young people in Ghana are not solved, we will solve it ourselves with entrepreneurship. And I can give positive and negative examples. We have positive entrepreneurs in Ghana and negative entrepreneurs in Ghana. And for the sake of the platform I am on, I'll mention by name the positive entrepreneurs. There's a company called Caveman Watches. Caveman Watches. These are people who are making above standard wristwatches in Ghana. They manufacture the wristwatches in Ghana. And I have found people from Switzerland coming to Ghana to buy the watches. And Switzerland is where you think you should be able to get the best watch. So if you are asking for the quality, my evidence is that I saw a Swiss man buy a caveman watch. We also have the solar taxi company. Now, these are organizations I'm intimately aware of, so I can speak on their behalf. The solar taxi company are manufacturing electric vehicles in Ghana. And I would like to blow this gentleman's horn. I was in high school with him, never liked him. I was in university with him, never liked him. And now I'm looking for an appointment with him. He's doing marvelous. And just last week, the vice president of Ghana was at his factory where he's manufacturing electric vehicles. This is a positive contribution young people are making. If unemployment is the problem, they are creating the jobs, they are employing their peers. There are, there are negative entrepreneurs, and that leads us to cybercrime and all of that. But because I cannot name them, I'll just gloss over it. Then there's also peer education. Young people, at least in Ghana, are not waiting for a huge institution to come and tell them what is wrong and what is right. Young people are organizing forums among themselves to discuss violent extremism in northern Ghana, to, dis to discuss problems on our, around our, our border regions, to discuss how they can hold government to account, to educate each other on human rights and what they can demand from their law enforcement agencies. This peer education is a contribution of young people, at least in Ghana. Then they are also organizing platforms for intergenerational dialogue. Now, this is where I need all of you to pay attention. Youth-led organizations have been convening and facilitating intergenerational dialogues as a means to get young people to influence policy. Now, they are not just waiting for the state to say, there is an open forum on Tuesday morning at this hotel or at this uh, public park. Come and tell the government what you want. No. What young people in Ghana are doing is that they are, creating, they are calling it whatever, but they will create the platform and invite ministers to attend. Invite national security coordinator. These are people that typically in a lot of African countries, you don't even know their names. They invite the national security coordinator to attend. They invite the presidential advisor on violent extremism to come and answer to young people what is going on. I'll give two examples. Of course, I'll give myself, my own organization, the Center for Security Policy and Research. Just last March, we hosted the presidential advisor on the Accra Initiative. And for those who might not know, the Accra Initiative is a cooperation between, so far, seven countries to stem the, t the southward advance of violent extremism from the Sahel region towards the coastal states. So it started with Ghana, Côte d'Ivoire, Togo, and Burkina Faso, and we've been, ex we've been able to expand to Benin, Mali, and Niger. We also have the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism. These, this organization is inviting at least I went to one forum where I got the opportunity to question the then national security coordinator on why young people are not involved in national security planning. And it was live on TV. And they are able to put, subject the leaders to it. 
the whole idea is if you don't create the table for us, we'll go, to go and set up our own table. You set up a table, you didn't invite us to dinner. We'll go and set a table and we will invite you. And we'll find a lot of positive, compelling means to invite you. I know in Nigeria, if they want to invite someone important to come and sit and dialogue with young people, one of the strategies they've been using is that they tell the person, okay, the young people have met and you are there to receive an award. You arrive and then there's an open forum and then <laughs> it continues from there. Now, not only are young people just initiating things, they are also taking advantage of available platforms. And every time we are praising young people of taking initiative, we forget the fact that there are in every country existing platforms and young people are taking advantage of them. What we often overlook, and we make it to look like an us versus them scenario when it comes to security forces, is that the security forces, the bulk of them are made up of young people. And that is young people taking advantage of an existing platform to make an impact. When you come to Ghana, with a few exceptions, everybody who joins the Ghana Armed Forces should be 25 or below. That means... This is a youth organization on its own, in its own right. And you cannot ignore that when you are demonstrating the positive contribution of young people. You can also look at the National Youth Authority, at least in Ghana, the National Youth Authority. National Youth Authority have been organizing forums and have been inviting young people. And they go there to participate. So it is not an exactly us versus them scenario. It is we are working together. You create the platform, we will come, but we will also create our own platforms. I'll quickly go to understanding the underutilization of young people in development and peace building. In Africa, and majority of us are Africans, is it not cultural to say that you are young, sit down, the adults are talking? This age-based discrimination has seeped into almost all our institutions. So when you look at the not too young to run, it was an institutionalized age discrimination thing that the young people had to protest against, and luckily it has been changed. When you look at the primary organization in Ghana that a lot of our peers praise us for, that's the National Peace Council, has no youth representation in there. And nobody sees a problem with it because this is a cultural thing. So we have our chiefs, we have our uh, religious leaders coming together to lead peace. But young people are not represented. When you look at the structure of the National Peace Council, it has a gender desk, but not a youth, a youth desk. These are the institutional issues that we are dealing with. Some young people just lack capacity. They want to help but anytime there is an engagement, it is limited. Some people don't even know that there are free resources online that you can learn from. I started doing these things when he was reading my, my profile. You hear, oh, I've gone to school here, I've done this. But I started doing these before I went to school to go and study peace and security because I was exposed to someone who told me, oh, there is a resource here. People don't just have that. And that is just in addition to what my sister has enumerated. I wouldn't want to go into the same things that she has given. Now, I want to end with a quote. The youth constitutes the bulk, the bulk of human resources that we require for our social economic development as a country. And I'm talking about Ghana. The youth also represents the future of the country. Current estimates indicate that 70% of Ghana's population is under 40 years and 57 percent is under 25 years ghana is committed to the implementation of the provisions of the u.n security council resolution 2250 as a way of enabling the youth to participate in the making of decisions that affect them in order to build mutual trust between government and the youth and this again is another quotation from our national security strategy this is a recognition by the state that young people will need to contribute. Young people are eagerly taking advantage. Now, when you go back to your countries, 
I am asking, to what extent are your countries engaging young people? To what extent is this engagement institutionalized? And to what extent are young people in your country taking advantage of this engagement? Thank you very much.